Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, latest lecture in the history of medicine and science series. Great pleasure this evening to welcome our speaker, Professor Lyle Hampton, who is Mellor Professor in the Department of Chemistry, and he's going to talk about elemental the politics of naming elements. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you very much, Terence. We've had a few technical hiccups, but we're good to go now, I hope. So the only song I could find that um, was about naming was, of course, Bob Dylan's famous song, Naming the, uh, naming the Animals. So I thought this play for a moment while we read. Well, so I'm going to talk about... I want to talk about um, the, the name of the elements and some of the stories around some of the stories around uh, the uh, elements of the Bureau of Table. And Terence is doing the can't watch to be able to talk about whatever I like and to digress if I wish. So um, that's the intention. Great as Bob Dylan is, we'll just move on to the next slide. <laughs> so, here's a pair of table. In, uh, what was it, 2019, eons ago, before COVID, you know, when the world was kind of normal, 150 years ago, the university turned, the University of Otago turned 150 years old, and also started the Bureau of Table, Mendeleev's great icon of chemistry. And you know, if you're going to turn 150 years old, you want to have all your teeth. And the periodic table does finally, just before it turned 150, we sorted out the last few elements along here uh, in, the, in the transition series. And even better than that, finally, internationally, we agreed on the naming of them. So they got named. So you know, here we have Nihonium for Japan, probably the first Asian uh, seen element, possibly Indium, uh, which really refers to indigo, you know, it could be related to India. So a couple of two elements, perhaps with Asian connections. Thorium, after the, uh, well, it's unclear, we'll talk about this later on, it's unclear whether it's after the Russian physicists or after the research facility. Uh, Moscovium, after Moscow, Livermoreum, after the Lawrence Livermore lab, uh, Tennessee, after the state of Tennessee, and probably most controversial um, of NASA, after the Russian physicist um, of, Na of, 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 of NASA. And here is their living elements. So this element, Element 118, named after Ognassi, uh, Yuri of Ognassi. Here he is, he's still alive. I checked on, on Wikipedia this morning, 90 years old now, and here he's still alive and he's got an element named after him. A little bit of debate about the about whether it really they found Ognassi or not. Um, I think most, four or five atoms of it ever produced, but enough to establish that, that it does really exist, perhaps. And of course, he's not the only person to have an element named after them while they were alive. And probably most controversially, the first, well, not actually the first person, as we'll see, but probably really the first person who was uh, openly acknowledged as having an element named after him was Glenn Seaborg, who of course worked on these transistors. Here he is here, Glenn Seaborg, at a, at, uh, pointing to his element on the periodic table. The first person, very controversial, as we'll see towards the end of the section, very controversial, but this element was named after a living person, Glenn Seaborg. Uh, and of course, Seaborg was responsible for discovering many of the elements I'm going to talk about. And, and Seaborg has quite a sense of humour. So he, he was responsible for establishing that plutonium existed. Uh, and you would, you would have expected that plutonium might have been called PL. It should have had the symbol PL, you know, Ognassium OG. But uh, Seymour had a sense of humor, and he wanted it to be PU, PU, the sound you make when it's a stinky smell. And so he sneaked this in without telling anybody. Nobody knows. And so plutonium has the symbol PU, PU, uh, rather than PL that you might have expected. So I said, a sense of humour on the part of um, Seymour. But they're not the only living elements. Because, so in 1952, when the Americans tested the first hydrogen bomb in the Marshall Islands, uh, and in examining the debris from that, they found two new elements, which they subsequently called Einsteinium and Fermium, after you know, Albert Einstein and Enrico Fermi. And the thing there was that, um, you can see both of them died around 1955. And so before they died, uh, these Americans who were determined to have these elements named after these two, uh, these two physicists, they met with them separately and told them that they were, it was most likely that the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry would agree 
to have any elements named after them. So they died knowing that they would have elements named after them. So they're not the only living elements. So, see this place. This, of course, is the famous, and I see my friend Neil's there, he'll know what's coming next. This is the famous um, Tom Lehrer song of the elements. I can't resist playing this. Or not. The sound. famous song about the periodic table. Um, Lear is always surprised that he was asked so often to, to perform that song. He wrote, he wrote many other great songs like Poisoning Pigeons in the Park and if you've never listened to his music, I would recommend, I would certainly recommend um, you uh, listening to it. So, with the periodic table, we've, if we're going to have a periodic table, we understand about the elements, we've got to have some symbols, we've got to represent these symbols. And of course Dalton, the famous John Dalton, you know, who was responsible uh, you know, for atomic theory, he comes up with a very visual way of representing the elements, and here we've got it here. We can see this beautiful visual arrangement that he's got. You see, it gets quite complicated when you start to just try and describe a compound. Um, so, this nice visual arrangement. So, Dalton's promoting his visual arrangement, while another chemist, the Swede Zaius, thinks it would be much more simple, you know, to use um, uh, the letters of the, of the elements. He's going to use them in the way that we have today. This, of course, is the origin of our modern symbols that we use for the elements. And Bezalius also, if you use if you use the letters of the alphabet, essentially to achieve that, um, what you're able to do then is you're able to write chemical formula more simply. And so it allows you then, as, as chemistry is more complicated, and you want to write balance equations, you can do that. Bezalius is, if you do the little Bezalius' formula, his, um, his, instead of having super subscripts as we have today, he's superscripts his material. And you can see that um, Dalton didn't like Bezalius' ideas at all. Bezalius' symbols are horrifying. Any student in chemistry might assume learn Hebrew um, as make himself acquainted with them. And they appear like chaos of atoms and equally perplex the, the adepts of, to science. Uh, to discourage the learner as well as to clown the beauty and simplicity of atomic theory, he was definitely opposed to Bezalius' ideas. And so we've got these symbols now that we're going to use for the periodic table. And of course, the great Mendeleev comes along. And the, the, the apocryphal story is that Mendeleev came up with the idea of a periodic table in a dream. Um, he was he had, he had cards which had the symbols for the periodic table on them, and he would spend days sort of playing solitaire with them, trying to arrange them into some sort of sense of the order. And on this particular day, he was supposed to give a talk in Moscow. The driver came to take him to the station. It was snowing, he waved them away. He continued to play with the cards, he fell asleep. And the, wolf, and the wolf fire, and when he woke up, he had the periodic table envisaged in his mind, and he wrote it down. That's the apocryphal story. Much more prosaically, Mendeley was actually writing a textbook. He had two, he had a two-volume textbook to write. He'd been commissioned to do this. The first volume, he'd spent a whole volume writing about eight elements. He had another sixty old to write about, and he was getting worried about how he was going to present the second volume. And so it occurred to him one way of doing this would be to try and find some system of the elements that he might be able to sell to the general, or to those readers of his book. And this was the driving force for this. Uh, and of course, here is the periodic table that he came up with. Supposedly, in the morning over breakfast, he'd been invited to a cheese factory, 
to, um, to I think probably to carry out some analysis. Um, he turned the letter of invitation over and started scribbling on that. And this is where he was able to come up with his, he, the idea finally crystallized. He'd been working on this for years, finally crystallized into the periodic table that he presented. Um, that piece of paper still exists completely with a coffee stain uh, of a morning's <coughs> breakfast. And so this looks like our modern periodic table. If you turn it 90 degrees, look, there's lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, there's fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. And of course, in science, publishing is everything. So luckily, that book goes to publishers, gets published, because three months later, the Swiss chemist Lothar Meyer, Joseph Lothar Meyer publishes the same table, more or less. And of course, Meyer's name is lost, except the chemist is lost in the midst of time, whereas Mendeleev remains alive, because we know him as the father of the periodic table. Paul Mendeleev, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in 1906, 37 years after he did this. And he missed out on receiving the Nobel Prize by one vote. And sadly, he dies the next year in 1907. You know, 19, yeah, 1907. So, you know, bringing this out, well, you know, people said, oh, 37 years, it's old hat now. You know, the prize wasn't awarded, he's not going to receive it. We're, we're familiar with it. He also was, for some of his life, he was a school teacher. And there might have been a bit of prejudice in the scientific community about awarding a Nobel Prize to a school teacher. So he misses out. And of course, he's not the only person. He's not the only person whose ideas have come to them in a dream. Kekula famously uh, discovers the structure of benzene in a dream. So there he is, dreaming away, hidden by the fire. And this snake appears in his dream, chasing its tail, forming the famous you know, Ouroboros, the symbol of infinity. And, and, and as a result of this, mentally it wakes and, uh, and discovers the structure of benzene. So here we are there, the structure of benzene formed uh, in that way. And so Mendel and so Kekulé says, you know, let us learn to dream, then perhaps we shall find the truth. Now, of course, having said that, you know, it's lucky he's not like Coleridge, you know, who, writing down the poem, Kubla Khan, there's a knock at the door, he answers the door and forgets the rest of the poem, and never comes back to him. Luckily, this didn't happen to Mendele, uh, to Kekula. He waits remembering the structures for benzene. However, he's not foolish. He also says, but let us be aware of publishing our dreams before they have been put to the proof by the waking understanding. So he's a sensible man. And of course, Kekulé has left us with a, a real legacy. So it was Kekulé, along with G.M. Lewis, who proposed the way of drawing structures in this way with these lines. And, and of course, we can super simplify that. We don't need to put the carbon atoms in. This is how the chemists you know, draw their structures. And here's an example of a modern structure. This is a structure of Taxol, and this um, cancer agent uh, derived from the yew tree, and now synthesized by chemists. And you can see that in the Mallow Labs, we were allowed to design lights that you know, have the structures of molecules. So this one is caffeine, essential to chemists, and this one's cortisol. And I think there's serotonin in the back there. So we were allowed to put a few molecules up on the, on the roof of lightning engineers designed those for us. So it's really sweet, I think. And this is a reminder of Kekulé and G.M. Lewis. G.M. Lewis who taught us you know, that there are two electrons. So when we draw a line like that, we know there are two electrons in that covalent bond. Poor old G.M. Lewis, you know, poisoned himself and then dies of cyanide poisoning in his lab. And 37 times he's, he's, he is put forward for the Nobel Prize and he never gets it. He must have had some serious enemies. Poor old G.M. Lewis. Um, but back to Mendeleev's table. Now, why was Mendeleev's table so successful? Because, of course, like any good theory, it made predictions. And so Mendeleev realized that the elements must be ordered in some way. And he was ordering them based on atomic weight, their mass, essentially increasing the atomic mass as you go across the table. And then he was ordering the the elements in terms of their reactivity. And he realized that when you get to this point here in the table between iodine and tellurium, you can see that iodine, because of the isotope ratios, because he knew nothing about isotopes at this point, you can see the isotope ratios for iodine makes iodine have a, a, a atomic weight of about 126.9, whereas tellurium is heavier, 127.6. So tellurium should be here, and iodine should be there if you're arranging things on atomic mass. But Mendeleev realized that the properties of tellurium were not those of the, hal of the halogen. And so he, he, swapped, he didn't know why, but he swapped them around. It made more sense. And the same thing happens, there are only two places in the table where this happens. The same thing happens with nickel and cobalt. And he realized that so nickel is slightly um, lighter than cobalt, but he realized that they needed to be round the other way because nickel behaved more like these elements, like palladium and platinum, and cobalt more like rhodium and iridium. So he swaps them around. The table has that predictive power. And of course, what Mendeleev didn't know, he died not knowing this, 
But what we know today is, of course, the elements are ordered by atomic number. And atomic number was, um, I guess, worked on by this man, Mosley, Henry Mosley, who I, I love the story. He looks like a character from Shakespearean drama, you know, holding uh, the skull of, you know, Horatio or whatever it is here in his hands. So I think, you know, it's, it's a wonderful photograph. And of course, Mosley worked with our, our own Ernest Rosen, who, of course, before you can, can begin to understand the atomic number, you've got to know that the, the atom has a single nucleus, and that's made up of neutrons and protons. And so Rutherford establishes that. And then Mosley, examining the elements, realizes that there's a relationship and goes on to predict this idea, to, to develop this idea of atomic number. But of course, sadly, Mosley is killed at 27 in Italy. So he leaves, he's working with uh, Rutherford at Manchester, he leaves his post at Manchester, he, he enlists because he wants to be a good, uh, a good citizen, and he goes off to the war, and he's shot by a sniper uh, in Gallipoli uh, at the age of 27. And Asimov, the great science fiction writer, says, you know, his death might well have been the most costly single death of the war to mankind generally. Talbot for the Nobel Prize at 27, it was to come soon, and he dies not receiving it. And so people have suggested, perhaps we should have named Alan after Mosley. But then the problem would be, how would you name that? Would it be Mosleyum, or would it be Mosleyum? You know, that's the problem. And I suspect that the, the ambiguity in the name, Mosleyum or Mosleyum, made it impossible for I.E. Pack to make a decision. So Paul Mosley never gets the element named after him. And instead, element 43, it's named rather more prosaically technicium. And despite the fact that element 43, the search for element 43 started in 1924, it wasn't, in fact, discovered until 1937. So quite a time afterwards, despite the fact he knew where you were looking, it still took them some considerable time to discover the element technicium. Now, that's one, so Mendeley had reversed the, some of the elements in order to make sense of the table. Based, of course, really, as you know, on all the atomic number now. But Mendeley did something else as well, because of course there were missing elements. This was another great thing about his period table. He realized where there were holes. And so he, he had a colleague who was a Sanskrit expert, and so he took the symbols from Sanskrit to talk about the properties of elements that were missing. So for example, you'll see there's an element missing here. And when there's an element missing here, he's going to use the Sanskrit symbol echa. So echa silicon, the element below silicon, which is, turns out to be germanium, he calls echa silicon until it's discovered. And of course, the great thing about that is, now that he's got this table of order, he realized, or chemists realize that the properties of germanium must sort of be an average between those of silicon and tin. And so they know where to look now. And so they can discover that. And it's much more easy to discover that element when you know what properties it should have. So germanium is discovered soon after uh, you know, Mendeley makes that prediction. And so you can see there, echo um, aluminium becomes gallium after gall. And then he uses this other term, dry. And this means in the situation where you've got two spaces. So here, dry manganese is well, when you become rhenium. And then echo manganese will be, of course, technetium when it's finally discovered. So Mendeley, by by realizing where the holes in the periodic table are, allows the predictive power of theory to let other chemists discover those missing elements. And this is why I think Mendeleev's table, and Mendeleev gets credit for the table, because any theory, and that's what a periodic table is, any theory should have some predictive power. And it, it makes two great contributions to science. So, 65 elements or so in Mendeleev's time. Elements are being discovered more as one a year at this stage. And so there's got to be some rules eventually. And so eventually this body, uh, the, the great overseers of, of naming IEPAC, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, the people that said you couldn't use the Lita in science because, you know, in 1960, the Lita was defined by the Americans in a different way to the Europeans, and this led to amb ambiguity. So when I came to university, I wasn't allowed to report volumes in liters or milliliters. I had to use decimeters cubed and centimeters cubed. In fact, the textbook we use in chemistry at the moment is very, is very IEPAC based, and it also uses decimeters cubed, much to the consternation and confusion of my um, first year students, I've got to say. So, IEPAC, the great overseer of everything, uh, determines that elements can only be named after a mineral, a place for a geological reason, a region, a mythical character, or a scientist. Not self serving at all. So, you know, when David Bowie dies, and people suggest we should have an element because they were naming those five elements that had been just you know, recently discovered. And when we're trying to name them, Zygium was not on the cards. No element is ever going to be called Zygium. 
as David Bowie or some scientists. So no chance at all. So these are the rules. And so and and I had my, uh, oversees them determined. However, you know, there's there have been controversies. Controversies. Not always do we have a, an agreement on what the names of the elements should be. And so I had stepped back and determines that when we don't have a, an established name, we may have discovered the element, but the Russians and the Americans may be claiming priority and it hasn't been established for IUPAC. Then we use this dreadful three-letter symbol for the elements that are yet to be named. So this would be, and it's quite hard to find periodic tables with this three-letter designation as I discovered. Because I remember the one that I was like, this is now a McNerium, but 109, so that would be unnilenium. Enium for night. Unilenium, it does have a sort of ring to it. Whereas Unil Septium doesn't quite press so well. So this would be, uh, so again, this is Un Un Heptium or Un Un Trium, um, Un Un Optium. And of course, at the moment, the element we're missing, and hopefully we won't discover it because it means a bureau table will once again be sort of toothless. Uh, you know, 119, Un Un Enium. So Unu Enium element 119 hasn't been yet discovered, but that would be its name until it gets a, a, a proper name. So I had insisted on this. So it was really good that, you know, about four years ago, and, and ready for its birthday, you know, we actually managed to get proper names for these elements. And so this brings me up to probably the most remarkable village in, 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 in the history of the Pirate Table, Yitterbe, a small Swedish town. And if you're ever a chemist, and if ever I was to go to Sweden, I don't know whether I will or not, that's when I retire, I might find myself in Scandinavia. As a chemist, I would definitely make a pilgrimage to this little town, Yitterby. Because in Yitterby, they discovered Yttrium. You know, it's, it's, it's a relatively small name, and you know, that's not a bad, you know, you, the TT, so you use the YTT, or you miss out on the E, you use the R. So Yttrium is discovered. Then they discovered Terbium. So, you know, that's T E R B of the name Terbium, that makes sense. Oh, then there's Ermium. They've got Ermium. Oh, we've got ERB, that's fine. And then they discovered Utomium. You know, where they use the whole name. Just as well they don't discover any more elements around Utomium, although because they're running out of ways of you can use those letters. So there we go. So here's town, four of the rare earth elements are discovered in this little town. And not only that, but others discovered as well nearby. So Scandium is discovered there, Gadolinium is discovered there, Thulium is discovered there in Holium. So Scandium after Scandinavia, Gadolinium after Gadolinite, the mineral is discovered near this town. Although when, when minerals are named after elements, sometimes it kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a secret way of actually giving a person's name. Because of course, the engineer that, or the, the mineralogist that discovered the Gadolinite, you know, is Gadolin. So is the element being named after Gadolin, or is it being named after Gadolinite? I would have to say after the mineral, because we don't necessarily want you know, to name it after the person. So it's ambiguous. Thulium, after the uh, old, uh, I think old Roman name for Scandinavia, and Holium, I think Stockholm. So this is uh, after Stockholm. So you can see Scandinavia is well represented in the period of time. Of course, these elements, the rare earth elements, they were, and for that very reason, they're rare, because vital for our modern technology, you find them in our cell phones. If you have lucky enough to have an electric car, then the batteries of your electric car there in um, TV screens uh, as well. Very, very important elements, but they're rare, and most of them, unfortunately, are in China. So it doesn't make things, doesn't bode well for the future of some of that fancy technology that we are uh, trying to develop in the West. Now, the spring, so as we're starting to make these elements, the, the rule, of course, of our impact is that, you know, the person who discovers the element gets to name it. So in 1952, the Americans propose, right in the heart of the Cold War, the Americans propose an element which they discovered, they propose to call it element 101 after the Russian chemist Mendeleev. So this element is going to be called Mendelevian. Now, as Seabold said, but in the middle of the Cold War, naming an element after a Russian was a somewhat bold gesture that did not sit well with some American critics. Surprise, surprise. That would be the case today as well. Um, and a French scientist subsequently said, you know, naming element 101 in honor of a Russian scientist had probably done more good for international relations at that time than politics had done. However, of course, that will, will does not last, because this brings us then to the transferring wars, which last for 30 years. So the problem is, as we're discovering these new elements, everyone's claiming they've made them. And so you can see here, America, for these elements, America wants element 104, or brother thorium, 105, hanging, 
and element 106 is Borgium. And you see a whole series of names here, and these are disputed elements. And so this goes on for some 30 years. And from us in New Zealand, the problem I, I felt as a student, this was terrible. Because look there, the Americans want to name element 104 rather Fordium. Our own Kiwi scientists there in the periodic table. How fantastic is that? Would we win? And so I held my breath for 30 years almost, waiting to find out whether finally the decision would be made in favor of rubber thorium, or would it be ended up called Kirchartovium after a Russian physicist, the father of the Russian atomic bomb, would be named after you know, a physicist who made the atomic bomb, or it might be Niels Borium. Well, Niels Borium wasn't really going to fly because you're not allowed to name an element after somebody using their first name and their last name. So you can't have Niels Borium. You could have Borium, as it turns out, but people were worried Borium might sound like Boron. Like, and you know, I said, I don't like ambiguity. You know, happy my mistake, but there's no Borium in the world. It's a transuranic element. It's hardly, it's hardly yet likely you're going to pick up a bottle of Borium and mistake it for Boron. Lots of Boron in the world, very little Borium, no chance of any ambiguity, but IUPAC's still worried. In the end, they decide the ambiguity is probably worth taking, and eventually, um, Alan Hunter Seven is named Warrior. But you can see this sort of conflict here. You know, so, um, so in the end, Rutherford, Rutherfordium wins out over Kirchhoffian. So we do get, finally, uh, after our agreement, as the, at the end, 1997, when things settle down. Hanium. Oh, no, we're not going to go Hanium yet. We've done the Warrior. Hassium, of course, you know, named after an old, old name for Germany. And Hassium remains. Element 108 ends up being Hassium. But there are two other, Dubnium, I should mention Dubnium in passing. Dubnium is a Russian uh, research facility, and it will see Borgium after a bird seaboard. But we've got these two interesting names here, Hanium and Martinarium. We've forgotten about Strassen, the third character in, 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 in the experiments, but we've got Hanium and Martinarium. And the feminists came along and said, well, look, you know, why does it always have to be? The Han Metner experiments. Why can't it be the Meitner Han experiments? So why should Meitner have to follow Han in the periodic table? We can't have you know Han being 105 and Meitner being 106. Why can't we have the other way around? And there was also a lot of controversy about that. And of course, here's Otto Hahn and uh, Lisa Meitner. Uh, and of course, what did they do? They were they discovered that uranium in 1938. The uranium was able to undergo fission. And of course, lose a small amount of energy, and of course, ultimately, that would lead to the development of the atomic bomb. And I'm just going to put a plug in here for you. Um, in the 21st of July this year, Christopher Nolan has made a new movie about Oppenheimer. And I just recommend it to you, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, Nolan, you know, Batman fame. Um, Cillian Murphy, if you watch Peaky Blinders, the leader in that is playing Oppenheimer. He's got the right sort of coquette, uh, thin, you know, smoking cancer sort of look about him that Oppenheimer had. He makes a great Oppenheimer. So I would recommend this film to you when it comes out. And those of you who are older may remember that the BBC did a wonderful production of Sam Waterston back in the 80s. And I've discovered it's available on YouTube. Unfortunately, the quality is very poor, but it's well worth a look if you want to, you know, wade through seven hours of um, Oppenheimer's biography. It's really quite good. So, you know, I'm, I'm dying to see this play out. This is going to be, this is going to be a wonderful movie. Uh, and I can't wait to, to see it in the big screen uh, later in the year. So other harm, at least in that results lead to the, the development of the, the atomic bomb. And of course, Hahn uh, remains in Germany during the war. So um, he, he remains in Germany in his lab. Lisa might know is a Jew, and so she has to leave Germany, and she, she escapes and goes to, um, to, I think, Britain in the end. Um, and of course, their, their, their work, she was a physicist, he was the chemist, um, and they worked very well together. A thirty-year relationship working together, but after after he wins the Nobel Prize, essentially he goes to her and you know, re and has, is, is on record as saying, "Well, she didn't make that great contribution to the work after all." Blah, 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 you know, this sort of thing. Um, and so, so Meitner remains friendly with uh, Hahn, but Hahn they, they never really get back together in the way that they that they did. So Hahn wins the Nobel Prize. Uh, for his work, Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Look at the date, 
1944. So he's, he's awarded a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1944. It's not actually awarded until 1945. It's kept secret until 1945 because, of course, um, the Allies don't want this to bring to the Germans' attention uh, the, the development of the atomic bomb. And so this must have been terribly controversial. 1944, war raging, and they, they award this to a German scientist who was undoubtedly involved, along with Heisenberg, in the development of the atomic bomb for the Germans. Uh, and in fact, Hahn is uh, imprisoned in, uh, so he's captured after war. He was imprisoned in England when the Americans shot the bomb on Hiroshima and then subsequently the bomb on Nagasaki. He was totally amazed. He did not realize the Allies had developed their nuclear program so far. He was even more amazed that the second bomb was, was a plutonium based bomb, that they were able to get their hands on enough plutonium to make a bomb. So he thought the German program was probably more advanced than the Allies, and he was proven, just badly proven wrong. But here we go. And the interesting thing was, as I said, this must have been a controversial award, but he was the only, the only person, only, the only scientist proposed for the award in chemistry in 1944, 1945. So there was no opposition, there were no other candidates. Hahn was the only one possibly indicating the significance of you know, his discovery, I suspect. That's the reason, you know, the reason for that. And you know, Hahn seems to, despite his involvement with the, the, the Nazi um, atomic bomb program, he, he seemed to have washed off and he was able then to, to lead quite a successful uh, career subsequently, as I said. No longer so much with Lisa Metner though, but um, still um, spoke of his views but if you're talking about controversial Nobel Prizes, and I and, and can't say I was allowed to digress, if you're talking about controversial Nobel Prizes, here must be the most controversial of all Nobel Prizes. This is Fritz Haber. So Fritz Haber, uh, a, a German chemist, develops the Haber-Bosch process. I'll talk about that in a moment. My wife always says, oh, she always rolls her eyes when I talk about the Haber process. So I'm always going on about the Haber process. Fritz Haber developed the, the German and first of all, war developed the German gas program. So he developed mustard gas, he tested chlorine, he went and watched the first chlorine attack. Uh, 10,000 people injured or died. He must have been responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers because he, he works to develop um, phosgene as an uh, agent of war. And he's very enthusiastic, very good chemist. He's very enthusiastic about it. His wife commits suicide because she can't live with him anymore because of the, 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 his enthusiasm for this. Uh, this weapon, and she commits suicide one day, and he goes to the front the next day to watch the uh, chlorine attack. I don't think it was each, but it was one of those. So why? So imagine how controversial this prize. Rutherford, when Haber was trying to, uh, was, was left Germany in the 30s because of the Nazis, he ended up in England and in Cambridge. Rutherford famously refused to shake his hand because of the, the deaths that he was responsible for. But what, why? So why did Haber get the Nobel Prize in 19... Uh, 1918, just after the end of the First World War, we need to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of uh, soldiers. Well, of course, the reason was he developed the Haber process. The Haber process takes nitrogen from the atmosphere, reacts with hydrogen to make ammonia, and from ammonia you can make fertilizer nitrate. He developed the process for, um, for developing artificial fertilizer from nitrogen. He referred to it as bread from air, meaning you know, we grow food from the air that we breathe. That was and you can see the effect it has. Along with modern medicine, um, you can see the population of the Earth around 1918, 1919 is about um, one. Well, I can't really read it there, but almost two billion. 1917, 1918. By 2020, it's up to about eight billion, and that's only possible because of the Haber reaction. All of our bodies, you see, I'm getting carried away now. All of our bodies have 50% of the nitrogen in our body is gone through an artificial. Haber process. Five percent of all the energy that we generate as humans is used in this process. It generates a truckload of carbon dioxide as well. But that's a whole other story. But that's the Haber reaction. That must have been the most controversial of the Nobel Prizes, I think. And so, Lisa Metner, uh, she in a sense has the last laugh because while Haber, should go back to that slide, she has the last laugh because while while um, Han wins a Nobel Prize, he doesn't get an element named after him. Whereas um, Meitner gets her own element here, 109. So no controversy whether Han should be in front of Metner or the other way around. She's there all on her own in the periodic table. The second woman, only the second woman, to have an element after her. And Marie Curie, so here we go, 
Marie Curie, uh, in 1946, has an album named after her, but of course it's not quite after her. It's, it's in recognition of both Marie and Pierre. And so perhaps those, um, the, the Nobel Committee felt more comfortable awarding that because Pierre was involved as well, I don't know. But she's the first woman to have an element named after her. Of course, she won, she wins two Nobel Prizes, the one for physics along with her husband, and then on her own right, the Nobel Prize in chemistry in, 19, in 1911. So a remarkable woman. And so uh, Lisa Metton, although she doesn't win the Nobel Prize because Han gets that, not her, uh, she does go on to have an element named after her and lives in memory for, uh, for that reason. And you know, women are so badly served in the Bureau of Tables, you know, might not have, we've got a whole lot of, you know, goddesses, fine to have goddesses, it seems they don't like to have real women in the, in, in the name of their own, it seems they're the only one and a half. So you know, here we've got um, uh, Vanibus, so this is Freya, the Norse god, she apparently drives a chariot with a couple of cats, so here we go there. This is Selene, the goddess of the moon, this is Pallas, or, or Athena, wisdom and war, this is Niobe, um, the, the, the goddess of tears who cries for her children. Her hubris calls the death of her children and she spends the rest of her time crying for them. So the goddess of tears. Uh, this is Talos or Tala or uh, Gaia, we might call her, the earth goddess. Syrian, uh, so this is Ceres, uh, the goddess of agriculture. This is Europa, uh, you know, famously um, had a relationship with Zeus as a bull. And um, Iridium, I'm not going to love this, uh, you know, Iridium, the goddess of the rainbow. So, you know, because of the beautiful colours. So, women feature in the very table, but as goddesses only. Whereas men, on the other hand, there's a lot of them. You know, we've got um, uh, Sumerian. It's not clear again whether Sumerian is named after the, the colonel, the Russian colonel. I couldn't find a photograph of him, unfortunately. The Russian colonel who discovered samarite, uh, this mineral or whether it's named after the mineral, it's one of those ambiguous ones, but you know, we've got Curium and Einsteinium and Fermium and Mendelevium and Nobilium and here's Lawrence. Uh, Rutherfordium, we've already seen, he's Borium, Borium, Niels Bohr here, the, the, the famous Danish chemist, who also, like Hahn, remained in Denmark during the Second World War. Famously, he, he took the Nobel Medal of um, von Laue and uh, Frisch, and he dissolved in Aquaregia, so the Nazis couldn't get their hand on the gold, and then that Saturn's laboratory throughout the war dissolved in Aquaregia. After the war, they precipitated the gold, and the Nobel Committee restructured the medals, so they got their medals back. So, hidden in plain sight, for a chemist to do something like that, I guess, but he was a physicist, they must have known, and not chemistry. Of course, Bohr, who um, was responsible for sort of helping to establish um, Rutherford's ideas or establish some of the electrons, but I think Rutherford's. Um, and Rutherford's atoms, Rosagen here, and uh, Copernicus, and of course we've already seen it in Nassim. So I think 13 or 14 men versus two women. So there's a bit of redressing to be done when we start, if we ever start to discover some of those other elements. And, or, but, and also, I mean, men continue to benefit because, you know, not only, you might say, well, you know, women are represented by goddesses, but men are also represented by some of the gods as well. You know, here's Tantalus, and Prometheus, and Thor, and Mercury, all the after elements. So there's a bit of gender balancing, I think, that to go on in the period of table if we, if we re and not to mention diversity, as I said, Nihonium and, and um, Uridium, uh, and Indium, the only two um, elements which kind of reflect an Asian uh, aspect on the period of table. And so, pop quiz for you. So we're coming near to the end. So there are many, there are many, um, there are many countries named after elements. So, copper after Cyprus, Gallium, the old name for France, Germanium, Germany, Poland, Marie Curie, of course, Francium, France, France features quite well, Americium, America, Nihonium, Japan. You know, we've even got um, elements named after regions, like Scandinavia and Europe. And, you know, there's even some regions, Magnesia, uh, district in Greece, Strontium, a town in Scotland, Berkeley, after um, the, the city in America. California, Tennessee, after um, you know, the state of Tennessee. Um, Holmium, after Stockholm. Darnstadt, Dion, after Darnstadt. Moscovium, cities even get named after elements. The river, the Rhine, is also named after, uh, an element named after the Rhine. So there are many countries which are named after elements, but which, there are many 
many countries named after them. There are many elements named after countries, sorry. But which country is named after an element? Anyone you know? There's only one, as far as I know, there's only one country named after an element. That's silver. Silver, exactly. What was the country? Argentina. Exactly so. A.G. Silver, the Latin name Argentium, and of course, Argentina had enormous and it doesn't anymore, but Argentina had large silver reserves. And so it made its, it's made its economy on silver. And so Argentium, the Latin name, so hence Argentina. Argentina is named after silver. So the only country that I know named after an element, as opposed to an element named after a country. And so on that, I'm about to wrap up. And so finally then, you know, this is my little granddaughter. It's the only time you should let your granddaughter play with us. One of my favorite elements, I might say. But that's a whole other story. So thank you very much. I hope it's been interesting. And the Puro table remains, you know, that wonderful icon. And there's so many backstories um, there. So thank you. Questions? What about the element 72, half million? What's that? Half million. Half million. Element 72. So element 72, half million. That's, yes. a, that's also named after city. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not. I'm not swearing. Oh, okay, okay, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So a physicist knows something about the periodic table. This is just amazing. <laughs> I've got a question about those uh, mythological characters that you had, uh, like Tantalus and Thoria and so on. And you said that the person who discovered the element gets to them. Yes. And did they just sort of say, well, Tantalus was sort of interesting? I presume, the element, I presume because it was tantalizing, I guess that element must have been hard to, hard to um, you know, wrestle from the mineral or, or, or wherever. I think that's the, that's the reason for that. Um, also, I mean, many of the names, many of the older names, you know, people, Humphrey Davies discovered quite a number of elements. He didn't name them after himself. There's no Davian in the periodic table. He chose other, you know, like Bringer or, um, you know, they, they were more, back in the day, they were less um, self serving. And, and, you know, more, and perhaps more well read as well. So you know they can bring in some of these classical illusions, uh, you know, to help. Um, I think elaborate. The, the classic one is Gallium, because um, uh, I've got this story right. Gallium, uh, you know, named after France, but um, the person who discovered it in his name is the word Lecoq. So he's somebody Lecoq. I can't remember what the rest of the name is. So Lecoq, of course, is a symbol for France. So there's this kind of subtle. People think there's a subtle message in the name. You know, Gallium referring to France and then back to Lecoq. So this is Gallium really a subtle way of naming the element after himself, the man who, who chose it. He, he, gets, he gets the name quite a few out. He also names Sumerium. He chose the name Sumerium. So there are all these sort of subtle messages sort of tucked away inside the naming of the elements there. But yes, sure. Yes. How, how long does a government have to last to be proven to be? <laughs> Existing. Oh, good question. I mean, that's a classic one, you know. Uh, unlikely on this, you know, some people think it would be a great name for some of those elements. Very short periods of time, and this is, of course, the challenge. Many of these, uh, many of these uh, later transuranic elements, you know, which are non, not naturally occurring, will only have very short lifetimes. So most of them disappear by now. So I would say the order of, well, long enough to be detected and establish ambiguity and establish unambiguously their presence is about it. it could be microseconds. We have the technology to be able to, but you need a large, you know, you need a large instrument, large collider of some sort to be able to make that sort of stuff. And in fact, when Seaborg uh, named plutonium, he considered calling it ultium or extremum because he thought that might be the last element that they would be able to make. You know, the last artificial element that was going to stop there. You wouldn't be able to make these other elements. And so it's been. I think he was quite surprised. That you know he was able to go on and discover other elements in the sort of transuranic series, but most of the elements after the uranium don't exist. They don't exist in the world. They don't exist in the world at the moment. Oh, does an element have to be like? Just the kind of there are there are um, about seven people with are powered up uranium in the world at the moment. So they can take it in and out. Does an element have to be established multiple times to be included in the periodic table? Ah, is it a question? I don't, no, I don't think so. I think it's just a matter of proving its existence. You know, um, the thing about NASA, I think, is that they, I think about four or five atoms 
That's all they ever made, isn't it? So, and, but enough to establish that it's, it you know, has a, a genuine, uh, a, a genuine existence as such. So yes. So no, I think, no, it doesn't have to be morally proven. Uh, if that was the case, then you know, who would you get? I mean, what, what large research facility is going to waste its time trying to reproduce an, a, a compound, an element which has already been uh, the Americans already have the sort of own, own uh, the naming rights to, I guess that's the sort of... Because so you're never going to do chemistry. Despite that, I'm so proud to see rather 40 in there in the periodic table. I'm never, ever, ever going to see rather 40 for real. I'm never going to take a bottle of rather 40 or rather 40 trichloride and do something with it, sadly, because it just doesn't exist. And you know, no one's ever going to do it. I mean, people try occasionally to do chemistry on some of those elements which are a little bit more long-lived. There's a theory, Seaborg has a theory, but as we as the elements get heavier and heavier, and so once we start hunting for that next row, um, there may be this island of stability, which is this, where you find this group of this group of heavy elements which may be more stable than these ones that we've been making along the path. But that's if you prove the theory that Seaborg has, and we're still a little bit away from that. But there may be this island of stability. So maybe some of those artificial elements will be, uh, you know, we'll find some chemistry. I don't know. Another question? Chris, have there any questions on the um, Zoom? No, no. No? Okay, well, it's okay, so I'd like everyone please to join me in thanking Lyle for an absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.